discovering new things to read and new public art. I'm Andy Schwant, and this is Discover Marshalltown. On today's show, we're out here at the 13th Street District talking about ECHO, public art. Today we're going to talk to Mary Giese of the Marshalltown Public Art Committee to tell us a little bit more about what is public art and where to find it in Marshalltown. Well, the Marshalltown Public Art Committee began about three years ago with a group of people in our community that were just interested in the whole topic of how could we increase the amount of public art in our community because we were aware that many other communities had lots of, of public art pieces. And so we looked into the issue, uh, visited other communities, talked with people about how they did it, and decided that we wanted to take that on here in Marshalltown. So our first job was to define what uh, public art means. And so we came up with the uh, definition that public art, for our purposes, is any art that is in publicly accessible spaces. Um, in our community, we do have quite a bit of art already, and um, that is accessible to the public. Uh, a lot of it is owned by entities other than uh, the public or the city government. Um, for example, the artwork that uh, we think of at the um, Fisher Community Center and uh, the environment there is not owned by the city. Um, however, uh, the art in the library is, and so that uh, co constitutes public art. Um, also, the, there's quite a bit of art at the Iowa Veterans Home uh, because uh, that is owned by the state of Iowa and uh, they have uh, legislation that require them that whenever they add on or invest in that facility that a portion of that uh, cost goes for public art. So we're very fortunate to have some wonderful pieces by some great artists here in Marshalltown. So the Public Art Committee said we would like to get a better handle on what we have in our community, try to promote it more, and to see if we can add to that collection. So the Echo uh, sculpture, which is behind me, is our first piece of public art that the, the uh, MPAC committee was involved with. And um, it was funded through grants that we received from the state, as well as local foundations, as well as by local fundraising efforts that the 13th Street Committee uh, undertook. So uh, we don't have uh, tax money other than those that we received from grants from the community that went into this installation. Well, we think it really exemplifies what we hope will happen in the future in Marshalltown, which is people, as they are planning a, a change in their facilities or adding some new, will think about art as an integral part of that um, plan. And so the 13th Street group, of course, was working on a lot of infrastructure things, but also as a part of their overall plan, wanted to have something that was attractive to the public here in this uh, plaza area. And for a while they had talked about maybe a, a splash pad or some flags and benches and so forth. And when the Public Art Committee uh, came into existence, the 13th Street set group said, we've got a space and a need for a project and we have a group now that's interested in promoting public art. Let's talk to them and see if we can't work together. And so basically that is what happened. We at uh, MPAC were excited that there was a group from the community that was interested in having a public art piece. And so we joined uh, forces with them basically to make this happen. Um, we're also working with uh, representatives from the Marshalltown School District um, as they put the finishing touches to the roundhouse at the high school uh, to be adding an additional piece of public art there. Um, and so we're looking forward to uh, seeing that come to fruition as well. And we hope that in the future that we've started the idea going that as uh, we work in our community for public improvement things that art will be a part of that discussion. The variety of possibilities is what excites me about uh, public art because yes, we decided this first one was going to be a very grand project to sort of set the bar and, and explore what was possible. And we hope we'll also continue to have some very nice pieces as well. But public art, it, it can be a very whimsical and fun and even temporary kind of thing. 
And uh, an example of that is uh, this summer at the Central Iowa Fair, we're bringing in an artist from the St. Paul area who makes straw sculptures. And so uh, the sculpture that he's going to build will be specifically commissioned for the, the fair. It, uh, his plans call for a, a cow, a pig, some chickens, um, a goat, so it's gonna be very whimsical and fun. And it is straw, uh, as a sculpture, is by nature temporary. And so um, we'll have to be figuring out with the fair uh, folks whether to leave that out in the elements and see what happens, let nature take its course, whether they want to protect it and then bring it back from uh, year to year. So that's something that's yet under discussion. But I think that's a good example. Certainly we have people that are doing murals and uh, other things that, that are up for a while and then they change. So that's what makes public art fun. Uh, as you know, there's a chainsaw artist who has done some very creative things with some of the trees that have uh, fallen or no longer are trees. Um, so we have some great uh, sculptures there and people enjoy viewing those. The Marshalltown Development Foundation several years ago uh, decided that a nice way to beautify the downtown area uh, was would be to bring in a, uh, a muralist uh, to paint the sides of, of some buildings and so uh, Carl Homestead from Decorah came in and after visiting with folks in the community selected the site by Zeno's Pizza uh, and so he painted uh, replicas of some historical buildings that used to be in Marshalltown. Yeah. One of the reasons that um, communities are interested in public art is not only because it's fun to look at and, and pleasant, but also we know that it um, communicates good things about our community to people who visit it. And there are certainly some studies that show that an active public art program in a community draws businesses and visitors to the community, and so it's a part of an economic development effort. So if there are people in our community that would like to uh, join us in helping to promote more public art in Marshalltown and maybe either financially or give of their time, I encourage them to contact either the president of the Public Art Committee, who this year is Dr. John Hermanson from Hermanson Orthodontics, or um, they could contact the Martha Ellen Ty Foundation, Heidi Pearson there is our past president, or the Marshall County Arts and Culture Alliance and their uh, director, executive director, is Val Ruff. And their offices are located in the Orpheum Theater Building. So we would welcome uh, any interest in helping us to promote this idea. Is that as far as the Echo Sculpture goes, um, the committee knows that it may not be something that everyone is um, drawn to equally. Uh, some people think it's really beautiful and some people aren't so sure. But we feel like that's accomplishing a part of our mission, which is to expose people to different things. And um, we, we've even said to ourselves, if it's not a little controversial, maybe we're not doing our job. So we welcome uh, all people's responses to it because responding to it is the point. Remember, you can find public art all over Marshalltown. Make sure you get out of it as much as you can. We'll be right back right after this. Uh, the camera is mounted on the bottom of the drone and it's got a gyroscopic capability so that it'll, it could stay still, focus on something, even though the, dr the drone is moving around a lot. So it's really stable and it takes really, really great, uh, not only video, but also still photos. Uh, it was a great experience, uh, kind of nervous at first, but then once I got the controllers right, it was all easy. Um, it was fun, you know, I thought I was going to break it, but I didn't. It was fun, I want to do it again. Little free libraries are showing up all over Marshalltown. Here's Conrad Jardin to tell us more about the program. The whole idea originated in, uh, uh, by a fellow named Todd Bowl in Hudson, Wisconsin, who built 
uh, a replica of a uh, country schoolhouse, one room schoolhouse in honor of his mother who was retiring as a one room schoolhouse teacher. And uh, this was uh, sort of a tribute to her uh, that he built this. And then he installed it in the front yard and put books in it and allowed people to take, take books, get, encourage people to come and, uh, and take free books. And so that's how it all uh, began. He, uh, Todd became in, uh, involved with another gentleman from uh, Wisconsin, from Madison, who uh, was more interested in the concept of expanding the idea uh, and spreading it around the country. And so the two of them somewhat teamed up. But the whole idea has evolved into it being now uh, quite popular around the world. There are uh, over 25,000 little free libraries in place now in 55 countries uh, in the world. And quite a number of those are, are here in the United States. Uh, when you put a little free library in a community, it encourages uh, interaction among uh, community members, as well as uh, you know, having the opportunity to enjoy uh, reading and, and possibly uh, learning from that as well. So um, it's, a, it's an appealing idea to me and having been involved with uh, continuing education and the education of adults in, in, in Iowa Valley Community College District, uh, I'm very interested in seeing to it that we encourage reading among all, among all segments of our population. And the more educated people are, the more likely they are to continue the, to read, so we want to encourage that uh, uh, throughout life and throughout the community. Uh, people, people are encouraged to build their own and hopefully utilizing uh, uh, recycled materials. And uh, actually the, the wood, uh, the main frame of this little free library and others um, was donated by a member of the community who had some shelves that needed to be taken apart. And uh, that lumber has become the, the main part of this, of this little free library and several others. Uh, the idea is that the, the person that builds it and hopefully the own homeowner or somebody else if, some, if there's some kind of a committee arrangement that's going on in the community uh, can build this at a very low cost and so you're recycling materials to build the little free library and you're recycling the books that are in the little free library then the idea is that you can take a book or leave a book you can come and take a book take it home and read it and bring it back if you wish or you may keep the book and you may bring another book back, or you may return that book. And then the, the owner, the steward, uh, sees, to it, sees to it that there are books in there um, most of the time for people to, to choose from. Some people build elaborate uh, little free libraries. They may have more than one shelf. Uh, some may be in the shape of a little one-room schoolhouse, or uh, I saw one uh, that's in the shape of a uh, uh, a telephone booth like in downtown London, England. And uh, so you can be creative. Experience. People relate experiences where they've met a neighbor that they didn't, they hadn't met before that had been in the neighborhood for many years. But they came and took a book and they had the opportunity to communicate. And they found out that they have similar interests, like similar kinds of books. You're promoting interaction among members of the community. And I think that's gotta be uh, a good thing. Because sometimes this post is a standard kind of a four by four by eight foot and then you cut a, the two braces. It goes into the ground two feet. You don't have to put concrete around it. Just tamp the dirt around it and that's it makes it secure. It has, it has to be on private property. It cannot be uh, in what's called the terrace between the sidewalk and the street. The city has, has that, uh, that kind of rule so you have to, you have to adhere to that. Um, you have to be sure when you build it, you gotta be sure that it is painted so that it is uh, protected from the weather uh, you know, weather can't get inside. It, you got to be careful when you build it so that you don't have head. You don't have screws or nails sticking out on the inside where someone might injure themselves, particularly children that might be using it. Um, uh, this is a plexiglass window. You wouldn't want to put glass on there because that's a possibility of somebody might get injured. Um, so you want to avoid that. This is a used handle and a used clasp and hinges that I happen to have from some other project, and that's. That's how you put it together. It doesn't have to be a high-priced, uh, expensive, uh, fancy thing. It needs to be a utilitarian type of a thing. And the owner, the steward, uh, can make it as attractive as they want through paint and, and what have you. Um, Julie tells me she's going to paint this post uh, to match the building one of these days. But you, when, that, when you buy that lumber, it comes kind of wet, so you want to make sure you let it dry before you, before you put the paint on it. 
Oh, we had a class this fall at the, at the college on building. It was called uh, Build Your Own Little Free Library. And we had 50, uh, not 15 people, 11 people enrolled. We had materials ready for 15 people, but 11 enrolled. Um, and so we had four extra sets of materials. This was uh, uh, Rush Yarrow, uh, the construction technology instructor at MCC, along with his students, uh, prepared the materials for this, which kind of fit into his construction technology program, so it was, and it was fine, fit into the curriculum uh, as it was. Uh, they prepared the materials, and then with the, uh, with the students uh, in his class, working with the adult students that wanted to build their little free library, they built 11 little free libraries, and so their Seven of those are in Marshalltown, which makes the 11 that are here now, uh, and a number of others are out in other communities. Uh, there's Eldora, Hubbard, Grinnell, and I think State Center. Uh, I think some are going into uh, Pine Lake State Park at, at Eldora, uh, because there was somebody that was involved with that uh, program. If somebody would like to build one, I'd be happy to talk to them about how, it go, how to go about building it and assist them uh, as, I, as I could. Um, I wanted to explain, however, that there are, a, when we built, when we had the class, 11 people built them, we had materials left over for four more. And so the students built those four and now they're for sale. Two of them have been sold and I think one, one more is sold and there's one more that is still available for sale and it's for $15 and you call Iowa Valley Continuing Education. Awesome. The class that we held this past fall was sponsored by the Creative Retirement Program and most of the people that were in the class were of, of retirement age, that is 55 and older. Um, although we may have made, a, made some exceptions in order to encourage this project uh, in, that, uh, in that class. However, another class is being scheduled uh, this fall by Iowa Valley Continuing Education. The number of students that uh, Russ has uh, in his class, I'm assuming that we'll, there will be that many this year, so they'll probably be able to handle a, a class of 15 this, this year as well. So, okay. and, and the way it works is that uh, the students uh, in Russ's class will help the students who enroll in the, in the program to get their little free library. The cost of the program of the last class we had was $35, and basically that paid for the the, the plexiglass, the hardware, uh, the post, uh, the roofing materials, screws, nails, etc. Um, we still use used material for the main part of the library, which again were donated. Uh, I, I could go ahead and tell you who donated that material. That's Dean Elder, who uh, owned, owns a store, a building in downtown Marshalltown, and uh, had that shelving that was available and was generous enough to. Uh, allow us to go and take that shelving apart. So Russ Yarrow and I and a couple of students of his went down there and took those shelves apart, uh, hauled out the material, hauled the materials out to the construction technology program, and that's how we acquired the material to, to build, build it. the main part of this okay. uh, project. So people could get a lot more information about Little Free Libraries by going to the littlefreelibrary.org website, and you can actually register uh, your Little Free Library uh, at, on this site and you can send in a picture and, and be listed on that site for a small fee. And at the same time, they will send you a, a sign which says, Little Free Library, take a book, leave a book, book which you can hang on your own uh, Little Free Library. So people are encouraged to do that uh, so that they become a part of this national organization, international organization. You can find lots of beautiful buildings in Marshalltown. So we put together a little program we call Mansions of Marshalltown. Today we're going to feature the mansion of Thaddeus and Angelica Binford. Thaddeus Binford, a young law school graduate from Ohio, came to Marshalltown in 1864. He had relatives in Marshall County, which was incentive enough for him to start his law career with H.C. Henderson. His office was located at the time in the new Woodbury building. His father sent him with enough money to buy his first home, 
a 12 by 16, one and a half story home located where their current home is today. In the fall of 1864, he married Angelica Beasley. They raised their first three children in the small home. In 1872, they decided their current home wasn't big enough for their growing family. So they moved across the street, tore down their small home, and built what we see today. The home wasn't completed before they moved in. They didn't want to go into debt, so as funds were available, three bedrooms and heat were added upstairs, as were the furnishings of the parlor. Angelica was a busy mother, but as the children grew up, she was involved with many clubs hosting afternoon meetings and evening events, which were most likely held in the great room, just off of the dining room. Angelica was one of the first women in her ward to cast her ballot in the last election. That was according to the Times Republican obituary, dated February 4, 1929. Thaddeus was a successful lawyer. He saved and invested his money in many businesses. He had helped organize the Fidelity Savings Bank and the Marshalltown Telephone Company. He was also a director of the Pilgrim Hotel Company and Tremont Company. The Binfords lived in the house till their deaths, Thaddeus in 1917 and Angelica in 1929. At the time of his death, Thaddeus was the oldest practicing lawyer in Marshalltown. Both funerals were held in the front parlor. Jessie Benford was the most notable of their kids, as she was the one who inherited the house when her mom died. She then donated the house to the Marshalltown Federation of Women's Clubs, who currently owns and maintains the home today. The Benford house was designed in the Italianate stylistic influence that was so popular of the time. A two-story brick home featuring floor to ceiling windows, decorative cornice around the roof line, a barn, and one of the first of its kind attached carriage house. As you enter the home, you are met with a wonderful curved cherry wood staircase. The upstairs library is located over the front entrance. The walnut built-in bookshelves with glass doors are original, as is the Italian marble fireplace located on the main floor, what we would call today as a living room. The ceilings, both upstairs and downstairs, are approximately 13 feet and add to the formality and elegance of the house. The shutters are original and typical of the period. The three matching chandeliers are not part of the original house, but were purchased by the City Federation of Women's Clubs in 1930 in memory of Mrs. Binford and others. They were not installed right away as the original chains were not long enough. The only hardwood floor in the house is in the dining room. The combination of several woods to form a parquetry border, which follows the curved wall in the room, makes it a real work of art. The kitchen was originally a square room with two windows on the north and a butler's pantry with one window and open shelves located between the kitchen and dining room. It was updated in 1970 to meet the needs of group meals receptions, and parties. The butler's pantry was removed enlarging the kitchen, but leaving the original pass-through to the dining room with its built-in storage space for extra table leaves. At the time, there wasn't any indoor plumbing. Homes were lit with oil or gas lamps, and food was cooked on ranges which were fueled by coal or wood, and were very difficult to master. Women had to know how intensely different woods burned, especially for baking. The Binford House is just one of many amazing homes in Marshalltown. Discover Marshalltown will be visiting and telling their stories. Look for future segments of Mansions of Marshalltown. I'm Andy Schwant. That's it for today's show. Remember, get out and see all the art you can and pick up a good book. For Discover Marshalltown, I'm Andy Schwant.